thanks. Thanks, Ross. And yes, hello, everyone. I am uh, delighted to um, welcome um, uh, my friend and a longtime APAAC consultant uh, and trainer, Kelly Fawner, to be with us over the course of this year, um, and virtually and in spirit, I would say. Um, Kelly um, has an extensive background in both assistive technology and uh, augmentative and alternative communication uh, implementation. Um, comes from the classroom and goes back to the classroom regularly to help teachers. So I, um, I know you're going to get a great uh, deal of information and, uh, uh, and uh, practical ideas from her. When I asked Kelly to do this, I'd heard so much from her and others about environmental uh, communication teaching, and so, uh, and yet, this is a treat for me. I too have never actually participated in one of these, so I am thrilled to be able to do that with you. Um, and I, I, Kelly, I don't know what else to say. I know you've been doing this for a long time. I guess I will also say that Kelly has been to Alberta a couple of times at, um, with the Assistive Technology Initiative, and so she knows from whence we come. Um, and we're hoping that perhaps we'll actually get her back again in, in person before too long. But I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just thrilled that Kelly is here. And with that, my dear, I pass it over to you. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Kathy and Ross. And um, everybody, and actually, yes, we've done ECT in Canada, in both Manitoba and in Ontario. And in fact, the videos that I'm going to be showing you today come from Canada. So I vetted those specifically for you. Um, so I'm, yes, I'm, in fact, I'm going to be in 20 classrooms <laughs> tomorrow. So I'm pile driving my way through um, a couple buildings tomorrow to uh, get some of my team started. Um, I do work in classrooms throughout the school year. I get started with people in the beginning of the school year and follow the paths of students either with augmentative communication or electronically, electronic literacy tools um, and getting things implemented. Um, and that's usually my focus is on implementation of, of strategies and implementation of tools throughout the year. Um, to get started on what we're talking about in this uh, process through this um, environmental communication teaching for kids with complex communication needs. Uh, it's really looking at some of the big issues that happen when, when we have students in classrooms and a variety of classrooms um, that have complex communication needs, um, whether they're using uh, tablets or devices um, with apps that they've had that, have, have, that are going unused unless they're being told to say certain things, um, whether things have been purchased for them or you've gotten somebody this school year that already had something, whether you feel it's appropriate or not appropriate, or um, sometimes people say that kids just play with their technology, they don't really communicate with their technology. Um, one of the things that the environmental communication teaching process brings to the classroom is strategies that are coordinated, that are open-ended enough that any tool can fit into them. You can be anywhere in the process from assessment to a tool that's been around for five years. Um, and we've been able to, you know, integrate um, students with very um, significant challenges, as well as students that really, you know, need to just have some strategies that they're working on becoming more competent communicators, whether you're following along with the competencies of Janice Light and Kathy Binger, or where you're working on operational competencies and strategic competencies and linguistic competencies. You know, what we're looking at is that we organize people's efforts through this process of environmental communication teaching. Um, one of the things that really helps me as we get started, and I am going to pull over this participant window, just so I can see the raise your hands piece. 
a little bit. Um, and just so I can just do an auditory scan poll, um, is if we've got any administrators in the crowd, you can raise your hand. And I know that sometimes people play multiple roles. Anybody that fills, fulfills the role of an assistive technology specialist? I'm going to have to scan through here. Um, people who are consumers yourself that you use AAC, or maybe an add to that, you have a family member who is a user of augmentative and alternative communication. Any OTs in the crown? Occupational therapists? Don't be afraid to put up your hand, guys. That's right. Hey, hey. Everybody does augmentative communication. That is definitely the thing that I've learned in being involved in augmentative communication since I was a paraprofessional. Um, that's how I got started. Other duties as assigned, you know. Um, physical therapists. Any sales folks in the group? They're always being asked how to implement the things that they sell. I don't see any on the group, Kelly, even if they're not putting up their hands. <laughs> All right, very good. I know you know the names. And then, of course, we probably have our, where we're going to hit our two largest groups, the speech-language pathologist amongst us. There they go, bing, bing, bing. And then um, the teachers in the group. All right. And, and of course, there's the people that I've missed. If you want to type into the chat box what roles I've missed, those are things Teacher that assistant is one of the things that's coming uh, up yes, in the chat well, box. What I started out with, um, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, I started out as a teaching assistant. I worked for three different teachers in classrooms of students with complex communication needs. And it was always very interesting to me in that role that, you know, kids would get assessed for augmentative systems and they would come back or the AAC box would arrive and everybody would take it out and then they would hand it over to me and say, make it work. <laughs> like, okay. We also have speech language assistants in the group. Oh, yes. Good. Very good. All right. Well, they will definitely get. This is um, the strategies that we're going to be going into of this environmental communication teaching. Thank you, everybody, for doing your, your, your physical activity of this hour. Um, the strategies of environmental communication teaching are just that. We use the typical environment to create purposes for communication. It isn't just that you got the device out of the box or last night you downloaded some app that you saw and like, you know, what's on TV? Because I know it's going to be coming. We have the new television program um, that's hitting here in the United States. I don't know if it's on your channels yet, the Speechless television pro um, program with uh, Mini Driver, but I'm sure that everybody's going to be wanting that kid's app. And uh, so, yes, it starts here. Just I'll put a plug Wednesday night on ABC, the 21st. So be prepared. <laughs> yeah, be prepared because everybody's going to be wanting what that boy has and, um, and everything else that goes along with it. But what we do know, and we know this from research, and we know this from experience is that just getting the app isn't what gets somebody to talk. It is what they are doing. It's the activity that they are doing that encourages communication. It is where they are that encourages communication. And it is the partners that are around them that encourages communication. And of course, all of these things also discourage communication. So it is throughout this environmental communication process that we work through how do you manipulate environment activity and partner strategies to create purposes for communication. So when you have students that aren't talking and when you hear me use words like 
talk and ask and say. I mean that in whatever modality it is that they are using. So whether their modality is sign language, whether their modality is to talk through an app on an iPad, whether their modality is to point to symbols in a pod book, whether their modality is to use their eyes and talk through their Toby device, whatever that may be, that is talking to me. So I'm not just a, you talk, when I use the word talk, it isn't just about students using um, a natural voice mechanism to speak out loud. Um, too often I'll go into classrooms and I'll say things like, well, what does he say during class? And somebody will come up and whisper to me like it's something terrible and say, you know, he doesn't speak, Kelly. And I'll be like, yeah, that's why I'm here. But we have to think about it as their voice. All of these modalities are their voice. And by using strategies that we're going to be working on, um, this idea of activity-based objectives is looking at through, through an activity, what are some of the objectives that you have that they can communicate about? We're going to, and some of these are things are not new to what you've been doing or what you've learned, but ECT brings them together and it gives us a focus together rather than competing focuses that we often have. It looks at what are some of the other environmental arrangements that you've probably used, having too few of items, you know, having things out of reach, or, you know, using peers as a purpose for communication, not just talking with adults. Um, we use um, prompting hierarchies strategically, you know, when you say what you say, not saying too much. You know, we often have way too much adult talk and not enough student talk. So all of these are going to be components that we talk about through this set. We get them started in this session, and then we keep um, ramping them up based upon what you're working um, with in the student. So that you know, environmental communication teaching isn't something that I made up. It's something that was developed on a grant. Um, from Dr. George Carlin, who is an educational psychologist. At the time that he was developing it, he was at Purdue University, surrounded by augmentative communication specialists like Lyle Lloyd. Um, Irene McEwen actually is a physical therapist, and he, she was seeing a lot of commonalities in students that had physical challenges and communication challenges, and that those two things together often had this complex communication issues where students were often done to and they never got to speak up for themselves. The original research years, way back in the late 80s and early 90s, um, and, it, and these strategies continue, and you'll see the listing of the states there, and again, and it's also been done in Canada in several place locations in Ontario, and we've got several school boards in Manitoba that like Red River, Beautiful Plains, um, some other places in, in um, the Winnipeg area that have done these strategies and have trainers in that area. The goals are always about increasing the communication of augmented speakers and also that we're impact, making impacts on classroom staff. So that even though you might be learning these strategies with me through this year, it isn't something just about this school year. It's about something that you can have as a part of your bag of tricks to take with you for you know, beyond this year. So you can always say, oh, this is somebody that we need to be using ECT strategies with. Um, and so that you have this to be able to use um, and move forward with you. We look at it as a five-step process, that activities are the foundation. And, and by an activity, it isn't something that you just make up to do. But if you look at the schedule of your day at school and how you break up the school day, that in itself is the essence 
of what I consider an activity. Arrival at school is an activity. Um, if you take apart a 90 minute literacy block or if you, you know, in the different kinds of activities that you do during reading, um, what you might do during math class, if you have recess, if you have lunch, if you have, you know, walking down the hallway between classes, these are the things that we consider, you know, quote unquote, an activity. But anytime that there might be communication and, you know, where does that start? What are the steps that keep it going and where do you end? That would be a so-called activity. I'm not talking about making up games like blowing the bubbles or getting out a farm kit and playing, you know, with a farm kit, like a language activity because our days at school are very, very busy. You don't need to be making up something special just to do to practice vocabulary. Kids need to learn their vocabulary that's in their communication system as a part of their regular day at school so that they can learn to use it during school. Um, rather than thinking that they're going to learn it somewhere on the side in some pretend activity and by some osmosis or some osmotic property, they're going to learn how to use it in the day. They need to learn it where they're going to speak it. And those are the kinds of activities that I'm talking about, the regular day, the regular school day. And we are all a part of that. And we need to be all a part of that together. So that's how we prepare for communication is to think about the regular day. Um, so I just, one of the things I'll have you be thinking about here is, you know, if you have a schedule or something to be jotting down right now is what's the schedule of your day or what's the schedule of that student's day from arrival at school to departure at school. If you're here as um, a family member, which a, one or two hands went up, What's, you know, what's the day like with your child when, you know, because we've had, we've done ECT with family members. We've done this in early intervention settings. So we've done it when you've gone to the mall. We've done it in, when they've gone to grandparents' houses. So we've done ECT in lots of different kinds of community settings and vocational settings and lots of different age groups. Um, some of the things that we'll get started is we're mostly going to be talking about these first two steps, but then how this can all lead to um, data collection, which is more of what we'll talk about in the second session. And the thing about all of it is that we can give you examples, you can see the theory behind it all, but until you practice it yourself, it doesn't become a reality. So how um, Ross and Kathy have set this up with the three different sessions is that, you know, I'm going to be getting you started here in September, but we're also going to be giving you the opportunity to work along through this school year and to get feedback. So we're going to be looking, you know, giving you kind of a calendar that you can follow along with and say, you know, do this by the end of this month. Do this by the second week of October, you know, steps in the process. And then um, Kathy's going to be, be gathering information. You're going to be emailing me things. I'll give you feedback. You know, if you're interested, um, we can do this through a, we typically do this through a video process. So we'll get permissions on getting video um, that I can look through and give you feedback. And it just moves through the school year this way. And you'll see some examples of it. In fact, right here, I'm going to um, pop into some videos of it. Um, the videos that I have to show you, this often gets tricky on the, you know, showing things over a webinar because a lot of it's got to do with um, speed of the internet on my end. It's got speed on your end. So I just, tend to show these in little bits of clips. Um, some kids you're going to see pre and post. 
Um, I always thank the families who have given us permission to share videos with people that are not a part of, of their child's team. The other thing too is because, um, because of video permissions, I often only get permit, only end up getting permission from one child that's in a video. So you're only going to see a camera on one kid, even though there might be multiple students in the video. In this video with Emma, Emma is doing a um, leisure activity. She's playing a go fish game. And she's, um, and you're going to see at the beginning, so at the beginning, she's actually part of it is that she's just learning how to play the game. But you'll also see that staff members are a part of this ECT learning as well. One of the things that we learn as staff, quite frankly, how to shut up. <laughs> because we often talk way too much and we don't find out how much our students really know and how much they already know how to say. And you will find out very quickly, as Emma's team finds out, that she knows a lot more about this game. She knows a lot more about what to say than what they give her credit for. What are we going to do? What are we going to play? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to play Go Fish. Okay, Emma, do you have any pairs? I have a pair. Okay, which do you have a pair of? Where's your pair? Okay, take them off. One, two, put them down. Good job. Okay, now, do you have any more pairs? I just hope that you noticed that she was already ready to say something. She was already, you know, she knows this game because she had played this game at home. Um, and yet the staff member with her continues to talk her through the process, which probably they didn't really need to do. And if you can, I'm gonna get my little annotator here. She was already ready to call on the person that she wanted to call on and yet this, you know, we as staff, and sometimes as parents as well, have something in the back of our mind that we wanted her to do. You know, first of all, the staff person wants her to go back and know the number before they want her to say the person. Emma wanted to say the person's name first. And you know what? That's okay. <laughs> Let her say what she wants to say. But, you know, everybody's in the learning box, and we have to, you know, think about that as, as well to go along with that. So that's just a little bit of them getting started. And then a little bit, this is about two months, next video is about two months later, okay. three months later. Do you have any pairs, Emma? Do you have any pairs? Okay, yeah. Some things are hard to learn. Put it down. For staff. You know what to do with your pairs. Okay. Now, please, please find out. Miss Lee. What are you yeah. going to ask? <laughs> do you have a... Four. Go, Emma, go fish. Go fish. We turn it now. having done this for many years is that sometimes staff are nervous to be on video too. So, and I, after talking to this teacher, she also said, she goes, oh my goodness, I was so nervous. And I wanted her to just keep moving ahead because I knew she knew what she was doing. And then I forgot, she was right. She knew that she had to go fish and I had to, and I just needed to calm down a little bit and move forward with the video. One of the things too that um, as a result, is that they found that they were able to, as a result of doing this, 
was to move further away from Emma and she would, there were times that she would skim on some of the words, but that they also were starting to do some more integration and not always having to have activity specific overlays. And so that she was using more of the uh, core vocabulary that was in Proloquo to go and not always being on activity specific vocabulary. So that was a very encouraging thing that happened as a part of their process. Um, one of the things that is um, encouraged is that you work together as a team. We know that um, in the past, as, as we've done some data collection on the um, students and, how, and student progression, is that we've really looked at um, how teams work together and moving students forward with their communication. And we've looked at, you know, that the core team of the classroom teacher, instructional assistants, um, the speech language pathologist, family members, and then any other additional members that are a part of the team. So I just want to take a little break here and see if there's been any questions that have come up that I need to answer. I have seen none. Yeah, and, and Kelly, just to let you know, I think people are, if they are commenting, are commenting to the the host, which is fine. So I, uh, I've i seen them on mine either, but um, I just have to say I've been smiling and uh, cheering on the sidelines. So uh, keep going. It's marvelous. Okay, very good. So as we dive into this all, I want to walk you through kind of how you get started in, in all of this. And so it is to think about um, your classroom day and look at the, think about the tasks that are happening. Don't think about anything, you know, doing anything like super duper special because, you know, it's going to be on video. Because one of the things that I certainly have found out through the years in, in chop it up to a Kellyism or whatever it is, but um, AAC is not a performance, right? It's a communication modality. And too often our kids get set up into that AAC is some trick to be done and then put away. So, you know, we do morning circle and I say the things and then it gets put away until I do reading group and then it gets brought, you know, my overlay or whatever my, you know, my app gets turned on and I say a couple things and it gets put away. But that's not what we're looking for. We want kids to know that this is their voice and this is their voice throughout the day. And so sometimes we target the in-between times, the in-between your formal lessons when kids are chatting with each other. What are the things that they're chatting about? And so we have kids that have activities around chatting. What do you say in the lunch line to people? What do you say, you know, what do you say when you have to borrow something from somebody? Um, we had a student that his activities focused on as he changed classes because he was a middle school student that changed, you know, every class period he was at in a different teacher's room and it was about going in, um, you know, if he needed to greet a teacher, he needed to greet a, another student, if he had to turn in homework, what was he supposed to say as he took that up to the, the teacher or if there was a, another person in the room that you were supposed to give your homework to, you know, what, if he had to ask a question of somebody. So his soul, his environmental communication teaching activity was in was on transition communication. So transitions between leaving a room, um, see if you need any help gathering things, what do you say to people in the hallway, and then getting into another classroom and doing what you had to do and asking for help kinds of things. So it's, you know, look where the communication struggles are because those can provide your best opportunities for this kind of learning. Um, we look at activities as a 
as they set up social communicative contacts. So we have, in school settings, we have four big contacts. We have dyadic contacts, which are your social interaction. These are the things that, that are purely social interactions, students between students or between students and adults in the school settings or, you know, in any setting, truly. Really. So, but at school, it happens during arrival time, departings. It happens between these breaks and transitions. And so this can be very highly stressful times for some students. And when we find that giving them communication can help to alleviate stress, it can help them to learn that communication is a problem solving way. You know, if, if I can't find something, if I can't do something, if I need help, or if I want to connect with somebody, working on this social interaction can be very valuable for you with a student. A lot of times our communication at school happens during joint action routines. So these are common activities where more than one student is doing something together. And this works out for all different age groups of students. It might be a routine that they're doing um, to pass out newspapers. It might be some, you know, just passing out papers from desk to desk um, within. These are, you know, if you have students that are doing jobs around school, if you have students that are a part of clubs, if you have students that are, um, you know, within homeroom have different things that they have doing. Um, if they are, you know, a lot of times during math group or doing during reading groups, you can find these little routines that are a part of, of activities. The key to a routine is that it is scriptable. There's a clear beginning. There's a clear ending. And you can get a handle on the vocabulary. It doesn't necessarily always have to be in the same order. Snack time is a, is a big routine, you know, that kind of a thing. It's very context specific vocabulary. We also have some students, and usually these are students that also have physical challenges. Um, and students that need physical kinds of support, students that need assistance with basic hygiene and physical care and dressing, or students that need help getting around, um, or students that need um, to maybe um, permissions to do different things. And um, it, what they do is we call these behavior regulation activities because they need to regulate the behavior of others to do something for them. This is not about students who, um, who have on like functional behavior plans, but these are students that have to get people to do stuff for them. And so I'm going to show you a video here of Devrin, who is a high school student that um, needs to go back to his homeroom at lunchtime to go get money because his money, for various reasons, is kept back at homeroom. So he has to go gather his money. And for other reasons, he also at this point has to take an, an adult with him to the cafeteria. It's because of behavioral issues. He's not allowed to go to the cafeteria right now by himself. So he's got to get his money. He's got to take an adult with him to go to the cafeteria. And that all gets done back at his um, special at home room. So you're going to see Devrin here in a video. Oh, that's not good. Well, you know, sooner or later, something was going to blow up. So we'll see Devrin going to the canteen. OK. And Devrin uses a pod book. At this point, um, he's getting ready. He's just about ready to transition to one, either turning his own pages on the pod, or he's getting ready to transition to a two page book. He's also been somebody that the people in at this school board 
have been sending um, uh, teaching assistants and other educators to to learn about pod at this teacher's classroom. So this adult that's with them is learning about pod by following Devrin. <laughs> And 
and I just love how the adult puts all of her, the canteen worker puts all of her attention on him, and she really doesn't even look at the staff member that's with him. <laughs> And then he also has learned at this point to intermix his symbol voice along with his speaking voice. So when she asks him what size, you know, he uses kind of a hand gesture along with his speaking voice to answer, answer a little. And this is what we, you know, our kids need to learn to do, you know, that, you know, if they've got some things that work with them within multimodality, and when you have a routine that you do over and over and over again, they learn to um, rely upon themselves. They learn to rely upon, rather than relying upon the adult that's with them. They learn to re have confidence in themselves. They have confidence upon what they can do as a communicator. And they use the modalities that they have. And they learn that it's okay to mix modalities. I can use my symbol voice. I can use my talking voice. I can use my gesture voice. And it's okay to put these things together. Questions or comments on that? I have a comment. I, I've seen this before because you showed his, some of his videos at ATIA. But um, one of the things that for me is the beautiful moment there, and I put it in, in the uh, text, is not only was his voice heard, but he was seen and responded to as a as a, uh, a a human being, right? Before they passed him over. So that's a beautiful, beautiful story, Kelly. Thank you. Oh yeah, and you, and you saw it from the pro because you saw it from Jennifer Donace, who okay. was is a speech language pathologist. So she, you know, she's got the whole story and everything behind it. Great story and a Canadian story. Love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, these are all Canadian stories <laughs> that I proudly show in America and in the United States as well. Woo -hoo. All right. So then, of course, we're at school. So the fourth context for activities is instructional. And so what we look at in these activities is not just kids answering questions, but are kids presenting? Are they? You know, the ones who ask the questions, are they a part of discussions? Uh, we've had kids that have done interviews of other students. You know, they've done surveys. So all the parts of instructions, you know, making sure that they're using all the different communicative functions. So when we look at activities, we're going to be asking you to script out an activity. So you're going to want to be thinking about what's the school day look like for this student? What is the natural environment? What are the routines within those environments? You know, what are the specific skills that required throughout those activities? And what are the discrepancies? You know, what are the things that you desire of them to communicate? What are the kinds of things that they do now? And what are the things that you want them to be able to communicate? And then that's how we look at we, what are the kinds of messages that they have. Oh, that's, that's funny, Kelly. This usually happens to me in the middle of my presentation from home. <laughs> hello, hello, puppy. That's not my dog. Oh, oh, no. Okay, somebody turn off your microphone. That's not my dog. I don't have a little dog. <laughs> He's really communicating about something. All right. Yeah, no, no doggy on my end. When you look at your activities, here are the big things that you look at. You look at how's the activity initiated? <laughs> how is it transitioned from the previous activity? 
how does that activity maintain itself? Like for Devrin, the activity is initiated because, you know, the bell has rung, that's ended fourth period, and it's coming into canteen time, right? So he's got to come from where he was and into his homeroom so that he's asking for, you know, I need somebody to get me my money, that kind of stuff. It's maintained by the steps of the activity. He's got to find somebody. He's got to ask for his money. He's got to ask somebody to go down to the cafeteria with him. Down the hallway are the steps of the activity. You know, he's got to talk to any buds that he runs into in the hallway. Um, he's got to talk to the cafeteria, the canteen worker, answer any questions that they ask back of him. You know, and then he gets his things. He says, thank you. You know, it's terminated when he goes back to, you know, wherever it is that he's going to eat his, his lunch. And then that begins another activity, you know, kind of a lunchtime social activity. So activities just kind of run into each other. As you're thinking about activities, target things that it's about the process of communicating, not the fact that they've gotten something done. <laughs> you know, that they've said so many items or that they've said, you know, three out of four, or that kind of thing. But it's, it's the process of communicating with the people that they're communicating with or about what it is that they're communicating with. You know, if you have something like, oh, they have to answer four out of five questions, I don't want you to be so targeted that way. You know, if you have a cooking lesson, you know, that they're a part of cooking or they're a part of reading, you know, you, I don't want you to be so, I don't want you to have something that you're stressed out with that you get started with. Um, you know, it's got to be more, more, it's got to be something that's more than one selection. Like, I don't want you to choose something with that they're just saying more, 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 more. You know, like, that's, that's not communication. <laughs> and, and I'll leave that for another time. <laughs> and you want to choose something that occurs a minimum of three times a week. Because you need to have something that you, get a, that you and your student get a lot of practice with. You know, ideally, you want to choose an activity that happens every day. That, that's why I like arrival at school, <laughs> because every day that they arrive, they've got to do that activity. So, you know, it's something that happens that way. From there, and then I'm just going to kind of go through these steps, and then we'll get to, you know, where we're, we're at in the process. But, you know, Step two is going to be building that communication interaction. Think about what you want to be doing this year with that student. Are you trying to expand their vocabulary? Are you trying to build language with the vocabulary that they already have? You know, maybe you're working on, a, maybe you've got a core vocabulary with them and you want them to be using that more. Um, do you have a student that you want to build multimodal vocabulary with? Do you have a student that their communication is through behaviors and you need to replace that behavioral communication with school appropriate kinds of vocabulary, with school appropriate kinds of communication? And so what you need to do is rather than trying to avoid the situations in which school inappropriate behavior happens, you need to get into those activities and give them ways to say the things that they are now doing things instead of saying things. And those are the activities that we script out. Um, we look at this communicative model. I've already talked about the social context. So look at if you want to do something that's dyadic, if you want to target something that is a behavior regulation, if you want to target something that's instructional, or if you want to target a joint action routine. Um, attached to the handout is a, a, it's a schedule of the day where you go through and you put your schedule in, and then go and you look and say, oh, this activity could be something that's instructional communication. It could be something that's behavioral regulation communication. It can be something that is 
your joint action routine. And so that first form is what will what I go through with teams as we get started in the ECT process and so that you can strategically pick your activity by the social context that you want to work on. And then once you've picked your activity, you write down the steps of the activity and you look for communication functions. And so again, working together, looking at what kinds of communicative functions are a part of this routine. It isn't just request, 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 request. Where are the social opportunities? Where are the, you know, asking somebody for information? Where are the things where you can direct attention? And know that, start with all of those communicative functions from the beginning. Where will, will change support is in your prompts and your scaffolds within that. Don't just go through and start with one communication message and then build on it. You want to have a rich activity to start with because that's how life is. We don't just say, oh, I'm just going to talk today in requests. No, every part of our day has social interactions. It has, you know, all these different communicative functions coming and going from students. What we look at is how do we support with scaffolding so that they can learn these different communicative functions. We don't just pull one communicative function out at a time. We scaffold the communicative functions so that they can be supported throughout the school day and learn them. And then looking at what is the behavior, what are you going for? What's their communicative modality that they're going to be using? You know, are you going to be using uh, or do you already have in place some kind of a core board that you add fringe to it? Are you using, um, use, are you using uh, sign language? Are you using vocalizations? And when that's, you know, when a vocalization isn't understood, what's their backup system? You know, what is your system that you're going to be using? And then as we move through this, and we'll, you know, we'll talk more about this at the next training, but think about the things that are in the environment that support communication. And these are all things that you've probably learned about in other trainings. You know, having materials that are around that they might need assistance with, providing choices, having schedule systems there, you know, having, having um, you know, a schedule so that they know what's coming next, having picture-based prompt cues if they're using their natural voice, but the picture-based prompts will help them know what it is that they have to say. So these are all things that will be talked about, you know, more um, in the next session. As you move through the scripts and you see the forms, you will also see some examples, and one of the other handouts is an example of a script. Then part of the script is what the student is um, expected to do and say, and what the adults do. Because we always need to be ready for what happens when the student doesn't do what they should, um, might be expected to do, or what happens when they don't say something that they could say. So we need to be ready because you don't want to just jump in and do it for them. You don't want to just jump in and over model because too many of our students have been, you know, over prompted. And so we do a lot of modeling. We do a lot of, you know, setting up the environment for them to have the opportunity to say something if they so choose to say something. So ask open questions. You know, don't just be directive and tell them to say this and say that and say this, because when you do that, you, when you just point to things on their device or on their app, and when you just tell them um, what to say, all they are doing is following directions. They're not learning what to say in that moment. So I'm just going to say that one more time. When you are always telling them what to say or pointing to things 
to tell them in a way that tells them what to say, not in a modeling way. But when you point to things and say, say this or point to this and do this, they're, all they're doing is following directions. When that time comes around again, if you don't give them that direction, they don't do it. So they become very prompt dependent upon you. So in a better way of doing it is to let that opportunity set the, up the, set up the environment for that communication to happen. Model what you might say or ask an open question. You know? So, you know, point out what somebody just said to them, you know, or what you might say to them back. So you'll see some examples of that in the scripts. You might give them options of things to say, suggest something through some kind of a partial prompt. You could say something like this or this and leave it up to them what they might want to say. Sometimes prompting is too verbal for students. So you'll also see in the ECT examples some nonverbal modeling where you might want to use a flashlight or what people call light shadowing. So you'll see that example. And then as we move forward again in December, you're going to see some things um, on data collection on these scripts. And I know we're quickly running out of time, as we always do. This idea of scripting is not that you have to follow everything in lockstep. It's more of a cheat sheet. And I use scripting because not everybody has experience with AAC. Um, it's a good place to start with many people, but also understand that you don't have to stick to the scripts. If a student has something else to say, follow what it is that they have to say. But scripts are also a source of what we'll look at for data collection. So this is an example of the form that you'll see. Um, you'll see that the student information will come down this left-hand side of what the things that they can do during the activity, and the whole rest of this form is for the adults. You know, what you might do in step one, if they still don't say it, what you could do next. If they still don't say it, what you could do next. If they still don't say it, what you could do next. And then you can model for them what's possible. If they choose not to say it, then they choose not to say it. You can't ever make anybody say anything. So, I mean, that's kind of the way it goes. Um, you'll, you've got some examples like the Go Fish script and some others. And the scripts really are about the communication steps. What, can, what students can ask and tell and say and answer with whatever modality it is that they, they are using. And again, we'll talk about data collection when we're back together again on the December 15th. Um, all this, what we're talking about, is setting up purposes for communication by looking at the environment, the activity, and your partner strategies. But for right now, let's focus on environment and choosing activities. Uh, to give you some, if you want to move forward with doing, actively doing ECT with us, um, we'll look at some dates here. You want to look at, you're kind of reviewing this foundation material. Kathy and Ross have said, you know, that you'll be able to look at this. There's also um, material that's up on AbleNet's website on ECT. There are two videos that are up there if you want to review it in another context. Um, but choose a student. Go through that, um, you know, the, the schedule of, a, of your day to choose an activity. And if you want to go through with videos, do a short video of a student. And I'm going to put together kind of a schedule for you so that those of you that want to be actively involved can be a part of that. But we're going to ask you to let Kathy know so that, you know, I'm not just making up a schedule for nobody. <laughs> Kathy, do you want to jump in here? I sure do. Thanks. So 
Yeah, exactly. So this is a really great opportunity to take something that we're learning together from Kelly in a webinar-based introduction into practice. So I am hoping that there are more than a few of you who are really excited about um, um, jumping into this. That being said, if you are, if you want to um, identify a student and start to look at the environment and the activities, so start to do some of the, the work that Kelly's um, discussed with us today, if you could please send me an email and um, I'll have you send it to my gov email. I'll try and actually no, I'm gonna I'm gonna lie. If you could send me an email to khowry at ualberta.ca, um, I'm saying I'm in. Then I will make sure, and I put the email in the chat window, and I will also send the email out afterwards. And um, maybe we could put up a whiteboard or something, Ross, where I can actually put that up. Um, that if you send me that, then I will make sure that um, Kelly and I will help facilitate this as well, and I um, are following along and walking you through the next steps. As I said, I think this is a, a great opportunity to actually implement what you're learning, and I hope that I will get lots of emails from you all, and I I really appreciate Kelly's generosity in, in the time that she's committing to us um, to make this, uh, take this from, from information into practice. So, um, yeah, any questions that people have at this point? That would be, oh, <laughs> emails are coming in. Good. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. <laughs> it's fabulous. Any questions that anybody has for Kelly, most of all, or for myself or for both of us? Thank you, Kelly. That was a great introduction in a really um, tight time frame. So I appreciate that tremendously. Will the handouts be posted? Yeah, we will. Actually, Toby, um, the handouts, you should have gotten them already.